Good evening. Venerable Chodron arrived in Singapore yesterday, where she'll be teaching for the next 10 days. And we look forward to having her back on the 23rd. So tonight we'll continue reviewing Chapter 5 of the Course in Buddhist Reasoning and Debate by Daniel Perdue. And as always, we'll start by cultivating a motivation. And today I found myself thinking about refuge. And when we cultivate refuge and bodhicitta together, we're encouraged to think of two attitudes. The first is an attitude of fear or caution towards the suffering of taking a lower realm rebirth. And of course, this requires an understanding of our situation in samsara that we're continuously impelled from one set of contaminated aggregates to another under the power of karma and afflictions. And so, you know, just checking to see how, how aware are we that that is our current precarious situation that if we were to die tonight, what kind of seed might ripen and propel the next rebirth? What kind of confidence do we have that it would be a positive one? We're also encouraged to develop a sense of caution or fear towards cyclic existence itself. And so our own body and mind are an illustration of samsara. We each have our own samsara to deal with. The fact that our, as long as our body and mind are controlled by karma and afflictions, then we're subject to the sufferings of birth, aging, sickness, death, and all the others. And then we extend our reflection to include an awareness that this is the situation of all living beings. We're all experiencing the various levels of suffering, all in this precarious situation, not sure about our next rebirth. And so we, all controlled by karma and affliction, so we generate a sense of concern, care, Uh, for all sentient beings who are also controlled by karma and afflictions. And the second attitude is an attitude of faith or conviction in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so just reflecting how the Buddha has transcended all these different levels of suffering that bring fear to our heart. And he's clearly taught all the necessary methods for us to do the same. And so we turn to the Buddha as the causal refuge while we're in the process of cultivating the resultant refuge in our own mind. And so generating this sense of fear and faith in our own mind and also a sense of a strong aspiration to benefit all sentient beings, then let's continue looking through these philosophical teachings on reasoning and debate they're a necessary tool for increasing our wisdom. And so, with the purpose of uh, fulfilling our deepest aspiration, then we continue uh, trudging along, wishing to benefit all living beings in the most perfect way by cultivating wisdom in our own mind. I came across a quote by Lottie Rinpoche that you might find helpful. He once said, There is no phenomena which cannot be understood. There is no doctrine which, if studied well, cannot be learned. And there is no person who, if he or she studies well, cannot become wise. (laughs) Do you find that encouraging? So this Buddhist reasoning and debate are methods for supporting our understanding of the nature of things in the world, how we exist, how all phenomena exist. And the Buddha taught the nature of phenomena because this is what really allows us to develop our wisdom so that we can actually have the antidote in our own mind stream um, 
so that we can antidote karma and afflictions and principally the root of our all of our suffering, the view of the transitory collection or the, the view of the personal self. So this is indeed a, a very noble activity that we're engaged in. So last week we were looking at chapter 5, reviewing chapter 5, which is about the two kinds of statements, statements of quality and statements of pervasion. And um, tonight I thought we would do a little review of that because the more we review it, the more it sticks in our mind, the more it becomes second nature. And also going a little bit further with some of the subtle points that Daniel Perdue pulled out to help prepare our foundation for actually moving into actual debate. Um, So we started with statements of quality and the various elements of those uh, kinds of statements. So let's look at these. We'll review the six elements that we looked at last last week. And um, we can we can even you could we can use a syllogism, uh, a very common syllogism to uh, as an example tonight to get started. So very often you find this syllogism uh, proposed or, or posited. The subject sound is impermanent because of being a product. Have you heard that before? <laughs> You're going to hear it again <laughs> many times. So the subject sound, or take the subject sound, it is impermanent because of being a product. So in that sentence, we have various elements. The subject is sound, and the predicate is is impermanent. And then those two together, the subject and the predicate, make the thesis that we're trying to prove. Sound is impermanent. And then the reason, because of being a product or because it is a product, there are different ways of saying that. So that's the proof for the reason. So we can draw out three different statements from this syllogism. The first one is that sound is impermanent, right? Second is sound is a product. And um, a product is impermanent. So let's look at those three statements. They're all statements of quality, aren't they? And uh, uh, let's look at the different elements. Okay, so sound is impermanent. This is a statement of quality. How do we don't know that? Because it's the way it's stated. P is Q. <laughs> sound is impermanent. Now, um, we'll, we'll cover statements of pervasion next week. Venerable Chuni is going to take us through that. But I think we probably know enough about a pervasion because we Venerable covered that section to know that if it were a statement of pervasion, it would sound a little different. It would it would sound something more like if it is sound, it is necessarily impermanent. Whatever is sound is necessarily impermanent. If something is sound, it is necessarily permanent. Every sound is impermanent. All sounds are impermanent. Things like that. So there's a different way of stating it. And we can begin to tune our ears to listen for that so that we can distinguish these two types of statements. Okay, so sound is impermanent. Is that predicate nominative or predicate adjective? Predicate adjective. How do you know that? Because it's by the formula P is Q, not P is a Q. Um, Right. Because impermanent is a adjective in this sense. Yeah, it's a... It's a uh, permanent, permanent, impermanent is a quality, it's a quality of sound. And as you said, it does follow that formula. Although we might find situations where that formula is used where it's nominative. We'll, we'll look at a case later. But yeah, that in general, that's a good cue. Okay, so if it's predicate nominative, that means that the predicate is a noun, right? It's, that's all it's saying. The predicate is a noun. And if it's predicate adjective, then uh, the predicate is an adjective that's describing um, the the subject. Okay, is the concrete is I'm sorry is the subject concrete singular or abstract singular? Sound is impermanent. Abstract. How do you know it's abstract? <laughs> it's a good guess. It's true. It, it's not referring to a particular thing. Yeah, and we could add to that 
it's uh, it's not referring to a particular thing that we can know by one of our five senses. It's something that we'll have to observe through our mental consciousness. So that makes it an abstract singular. If it was concrete singular, what would we? How would we rephrase that? Instead of saying sound is impermanent, if it was concrete singular, how would we phrase that? The sound is impermanent, or this sound, or that sound, or the sound of the bird is impermanent. It would be a very particular sound that we could observe with one of our senses, obviously our our ear consciousness. Okay, good. And then is this collective predication or distributive predication? Collective predication. Okay, do you know why? <laughs> Adjective applies to the term as a whole, as a collective whole, not as an individual. That's right. Yes, okay. So last week we didn't highlight this, but I'd like us to take a look at the bottom of page 76, the very last paragraph on page 76, because Daniel Perdue has something more to say about this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 76, and it starts with, since the predicate of a statement of a quality, since the predicate of a statement. For those of you using your Kindle version or ebook. Okay, so let's just read through this. Since the predicate of a statement of a quality always says something about the subject as a collective whole, the subject is singular and the predica predicate says something about the single subject, as you were saying, about the single subject. So. Um, our sentence is, um, sound is impermanent, means that sound, or a sound, I'm just substituting there, understood as an abstract singular entity. And sound in and of itself is an impermanent phenomena, one among many. Okay, let's keep going, because the next paragraph really reveals it. As opposed to collective predication, with distributive predication, the grammatical predicate is applied to the subject distributively. In other words, each and every, each and every occurrence of the subject. We sometimes read a statement of a quality in English as involving distributive predication, but that is not the intent of the statement of a quality in this, in this system of reasoning. So he's pointing out something very particular here. He's trying to highlight that we're using words in a very specific way. So if we say a sound or the sound, we're talking about a collection of sound. We're, we're not talking about each and every sound. If we were to talk about each and every sound, we would say, well, how, do you remember how we would say that? Instead of saying a sound or the sound, we'd have to say sounds are impermanent. And in this system, how that's understood is that each and every sound, is a, it becomes a pervasive statement. In fact, I think he goes on to say that. Yeah, if we read a little bit further. Okay, so even, um, let's see, where do we pick up? Indeed, you see where I am? At the bottom of that first full paragraph. Indeed, sometimes in English, even when the subject is grammatically singular, we can easily see that the intent is distributive. For instance, a man is a mysterious thing. Or chairs are impermanent. Chairs, plural. Okay. This is a poetic expression that clearly means that each and every man is a mysterious thing, or as Venerable interpreted, each and every living being or human being is a mysterious thing. It is singular, but the flourish sets it apart, and we understand that it applies to all of us. Oh yeah, he does too. Women and children as well as as well, presumably. Okay. So when we want to be clear that we mean to use distributive predication, we tend to use the subject in the plural, like men are mysterious or sounds are impermanent. So that's something that we have to tune our ear for because that's different than how we use common English language. So it's just a quirk of this particular system. Okay. Um, however, such statements have to be understood not as statements of qualities, but as statements of pervasion. 
because we're talking about each and every example of that thing. So it becomes pervasive. For that is their intent. They intend to say something about each and every man or each and every chair, each and every sound, whatever it is we're talking about. It's talking about each and every one of them. Okay? Is that clear? You might have to read through that section a few times for that to really drop, for the penny to drop. But I think very simply said, if we read a statement that says a thing, whatever it might be, a thing or the thing, a very specific thing, the concrete singular, um, then it's most likely going to be um, a statement of quality, and you know, followed by a predicate or a noun. It's going to be a statement of quality. If we're talking about the plural, uh, then it's going to be a statement of pervasion. Okay, that, that's, and so that's what these big words mean. Um, collective dis distribution, or no, predication, <laughs> collective predication, is talking about, it's the predicate is applied to um, the whole set, like a singular set, a singular thing, or a, the collective whole, there you go. But it's a single whole, it's a single collection, okay? Yeah. And if we're talking about um, distributive predication, then we're talking about each and every example of that. And the subject will be plural. Okay, there are some exceptions to this rule, of course, so we'll look at those on the next page. O okay, I, I think I may have made this point, but just I'm going to repeat it one more time. So if we're talking about collective predication, that says something about the single subject, and that is what it can be an abstract singular, like sound is impermanent, or it can be a concrete singular, like sound is sound, a sound is impermanent. If it's distributive predication, then it says something about each and every occurrence of the subject, and the subject will be plural. And it will be a statement of pervasion. Okay? So that's a, a nice hint. Whenever we're talking about predication, it's always, for statements of quality, it's always going to be collective predication. When we start working with actual syllogisms, constructing actual syllogisms, this will make more sense. Maybe. <laughs> we hope. At least we've covered our bases in looking at the foundational material. Okay, then the second uh, statement we can pull out from that syllogism is that sound is a product. Okay, so again, this is a s statement of quality because it's following the format of a statement of quality. Um, the predicate is, is somehow qualifying the subject. So sound is a product. Um, sound is a product. I'm sorry. The predicate... Um, well, but, okay, yes, product is the sign in the whole syllogism. Sound, sound the, su the subject sound is a predicate because, I mean, is, a, is impermanent because it's a product. But we're just pulling out a statement. We're just pulling out a statement that says sound is a product. So if we're just looking at those two things, then we have a subject and a predicate. Okay? And actually, this is what we will be doing when we're looking to see if a syllogism is a correct syllogism. The first thing we do is to look to see... Um, um, I can't, can't remember Venable's, the property of the subject. We check, is the, the sign or the reason a property of the subject? You know, is sound a product? Well, here we're not making it a question. We're just saying sound is a product. Okay, so I'm just using those elements to give us a basis. All right, so um, this is a statement of quality. If it were a statement of pervasion, how might we phrase that? Sounds are products. Sounds are products. Right. That's one way. Sound, it's necessarily a product. That's another way we can state it. Remember there was that whole page and a half of different ways that we could uh, state pervasions, and we'll get to that next week. Okay, so sounds are products, all sounds are products. If it's a sound, it, oh, sorry, yes. If it's a sound, it's necessarily a product. 
Whatever is a sound is necessarily a product. If something is a sound, it is necessarily a product. Every sound is a product, etc. <laughs> yes. So when you say sound is impermanent, and then you think of specific instances of sound, then it would be also collective distribution. I'm sorry, it would be distributive predication. So you say sound is impermanent, and then you give an example of a bird. So that Because that's a sound, that's impermanent. It's kind of like another a deduction. Uh, not quite. So when we were talking about the sound of the bird, that was a very specific sound so that we're making a concrete singular, um, as opposed to an abstract singular like sound is impermanent, just general sound, abstract sound that we'd have to think about to, to understand. And then she gave the example, uh, to make a concrete singular, we'd say a particular sound. But that's not saying each and every sound. I mean, in English it might sound that way. In English, that's how we might understand it, but he's trying to get us to understand that that's not how it's used in this philosophical system. Yeah, it's just interesting how sound is different than a concrete example of a sound. It's a different entity. Yeah. But it gets its, it, it gets its character from actual instances of, real, of you know, existent things. I mean, they're all existent, but... You can't equate the two. It's just interesting. Yeah. Good. Keep, keep thinking about it. <laughs> All right. So sound is a product. I, I used to wonder, how is this different from sound is impermanent? This is an aside. But in this philosophical system, product is a coarser level of dependence. Product, when something is a product, it's caused or it's created. Uh, and we could know those causes and conditions. If something's impermanent, that's really referring to subtle impermanence. And that we can't know with our senses, can we? We have to use logic and reasoning to understand that sound, something like sound is impermanent, or it, at the most subtle level, that is changing moment to moment. Um, so in case you had that question in your mind. So in the statement, sound is a product, is this a... Predicate nominative or predicate adjective? Sound is a product. It's a predi predicate nominative. That's right. How do you know that? Because product is a noun. Yeah. Yes, and um, one clue that we can use is if it just says P is Q, predicate adjective. Not it, not pervasively, but generally. And if it says P is a Q, then it's talking about a noun. So last week when you brought up the example, uh, a sprout is an effect, we, we could have, if I, I, I didn't catch it fast enough to know that if it's an effect, it's talking about a noun. Yeah. However, there are times where, and we'll, we'll see an example of this, where we can talk about um, like a plural noun, and then you may not say ah before it or the before it. So we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, so this is predicate nominative. If it was, um, yeah, that's enough. And is the subject sound a concrete singular or an abstract singular? It's still abstract, isn't it? If it were as concrete, what would we say? How would we make a different statement? The sound. Mm -hmm. Sound of running water. So we'd make it a very specific sound. A concrete. What's that? My last word <laughs> is a sound. The sound of my last word is a product. Okay. And then is this an example of collective predication or distributive? I've given you a really good clue. Collective. Thank you. They're all going to be collective for... Um, statements of quality. Okay, so let's look at the the third statement we can pull out of that syllogism, and that is, a product is impermanent. Now, I think, yeah, I think you have to say it that way. It, it would sound funny in English to say product is impermanent, 
So we say a product or the product is impermanent. So again, is this a statement of quality or a statement of pervasion? Quality. It's a statement of quality because the product has the quality of being impermanent. Okay. So again, if this were a statement of pervasion, what would we say? Whatever is a product is, Im- is necessarily impermanent. Yeah. Can you think of another way? If it is a product, it's necessarily impermanent. Products are impermanent. Right. So we'd go to the plural. Because when we say something in plural, that it implies that every single instance of that. And so that becomes a pervasive statement. Okay. So again, is this predicate nominative or predicate adjective? A product is impermanent. So impermanent is qualifying uh, a product. Mm-hmm. Um, and is this subject concrete singular or abstract singular? A product is impermanent. It's abstract, isn't it? All right, and so if it were concrete, um, wait, a product is impermanent. This product would be a concrete singular, or mm, the seed, which is a product, is impermanent. Okay? And, of course, it's what kind of predication? Why is it collective predication? Because the predicate applies to the subject as a collective whole. Yes. Thank you. Great answer. Okay. So this is the kind of drilling that's very helpful just to... You know, keep your mind coming back to it again and again, and um, so that we can answer quickly. Venerable Chinni was telling me a, a story about her time in India today. That in her, in her um, experiences of debating, beginning to do some debate with uh, some um, I don't know friends, monks you met in monks and nuns you met in. Okay, he was like the tutor of Geshe Wangmo's class, and when he was debating with students, then he would press them to be very quick. It's just a way to sharpen the mind. Um, So right now we're learning, and it's perfectly okay to say um and ah and I'm not sure, (laughs) but we're aiming for familiarity to the point that we can answer very quickly, sharpen our mind. Okay. Any questions about those six elements? Are they getting pretty clear in your mind? Did you make some example? I won't ask that. Okay. So there are, in the next page and a half or two pages, there are some very specific things that Professor Purdue is trying to point out to us. Um, And so I thought just uh, slow reading is a good way to try to draw them out. We've already gone through it once, um, but let's let's do it again and, and try to uh, really hone in on the points he's trying to make, and I'll try to make comments. Um, so we've been talking about singular uh, subjects. Uh, of course, sometimes, he says, at, at the bottom of page 77, of course, sometimes the subject may be pairs or groups of things, But even then, as the statement is understood in Buddhist reasoning and debate, the subjects are abstract singulars, a collective group. And the predicate is not to be understood as distributive. So, for instance, you can say, a table and a chair are material phenomena. Or, a table and a chair are a material phenomena. So, isn't that interesting? We could understand that as... um, Predicate nominative or predicate adjective? Well, actually, no, I have a doubt about that. Either way we say that, do you think it would still be predicate nominative? It would still be a noun, even if we don't use the word A, the article A. Okay, so a table and a chair are material phenomena. Because we're talking about phenomena, that is a noun, for sure. Now, it's maybe a little confusing. Material is is like an adjective for that noun. But primarily it's a noun. Table and chair are a material phenomena. Um, so that is predicate nominative. 
Okay. The thing here is that that subject, a table and a chair, are abstract singular because we're talking about the group table and chair. So it's almost like we could put parentheses around a table and chair. And we're going to take that as one thing or a collection, a whole. <coughs> Is why I find the first instance of the example confusing and maybe contradictory because, and this is my question, mm -hmm. a table and a chair are material phenomena. Phenomena is given in plural, whereas we have, presumably, a singular subject. Yes. Okay, so uh, two things about that. One is that we're talking about a table and a chair, the set. So, it, for all intents and purposes, we're talking about a collection. Um, what was I going to say about that? But we also need to use proper English when we can. And this is the tricky part, trying to translate Tibetan into English and still have it sound like a reasonable conversation, not like some false thing. Like, we don't have to drop all the particles in front of every subject that we talk about or do something funny. When we can, we need to use proper English. So we are talking about two things. I mean, we're talking, it's tricky. We're talking about two things, the chair and the table, the two, which is a set. <laughs> and they are, it doesn't say a set, but that's what's implied. So we're talking about two things, which are a set, and collectively they are material phenomena. So, but however, if Okay, I understand my English is limited, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if I were to say the set, I would say the set is a material phenomenon, because yeah. the set, it would be a singular, attainment is singular. Yes, however, I think we get away with this here because there is nothing that is a table and a chair both, right? We're talking about two things that make up a set. I prefer to say this. A set, the set, or the pair, mm -hmm. a table and a chair, is a material phenomenon. Just to, if I was talking to somebody and wanting to make this like easy, uh huh. I mean, he's, I get what he's doing here, but it's so hard. <laughs> I would rather just make it easy. Okay. Well, <laughs> but I know what he's. He's just trying to teach us. Yes. Like, good. hey, people aren't going to talk that way. Look for the intent because yeah. this is. He's trying to present the difficulties that we will come up with being English speakers when we come up. Often you hear pillar and pot or pillar and vase, the two, as the subject. Are we going to say is? That's going to sound really funny to our English speaking ears. The two are even though they're a collection. There's two of them. So it's not going to be a perfect fit. Um, maybe it works better in Tibetan because I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, this is what we have to live with. And what, that's why he's pointing it out. That's why we're, we're going over it again tonight to try to understand. All right, let's keep going with that. Okay, on the next page. Um, okay, so first we had a table and a chair are material phenomena. That's um, predicate nominative. Then we have a table and a chair are impermanent phenomena. Still, it's um, predicate nominative again. Okay. Since both of these things are true, you can say a table and a chair are material phenomena and impermanent phenomena. So now we're saying two things about the one set. And we can get away with that. However, as the sentence is read in this system of thought, it is not suitable to say, a table and a chair are a table and a chair. You remember why? There is no one thing that is both a table and a chair. I mean, I'm sure there are furniture companies who have tried to make something that is a table and a chair, but we're just talking very generally that a table is a table, a chair is a chair. Okay, so again it's the set. A table and a chair, the two, are not actually a table and they're not actually a chair because there is nothing that is the two. Yeah. Okay, this is just some of the quirky things you find in 
this philosophical system. Okay, so he goes on to say, this is because a table and a chair, taken together, or as a set, are not a table, and also a table and chair, taken together, are not a chair. Why not? Because the subject must stand together as one collective whole. Okay, so that's just another separate little bit of information to file away when we start talking about sets. All right, so let's look and see what the next section is about. In a s yes. So is this because when any subject, even if we're saying multiple things as that subject, it's taken as a set or it's, it's taken as one thing? Is that what you're saying there? Well, I think it would depend on your intention. I'm trying to think if I can imagine any subject I've heard of where you're talking about more than one thing Usually you're looking to see what's the relationship of this subject, um, you know, with a particular predicate. And you're trying to find a reason for that, a valid reason, something that will stand up to scrutiny. Um, but we also have, well, see, even when we talk about uh, generalities, like we talk about objects of knowledge, that's plural. Um, but we can take that, it's one category, right? Right now, in this moment, I can't think of a subject that would include two things that are not taken as a set. But I'll give that some more thought. Okay, and if we come up, uh, if we find an example of that in the book, then we can revisit this. In a statement of quality such as P is a Q, the subject is always a concrete or abstract singular, and the predicate always says something about the subject or subjects as a collective whole. So that's the collective predication. In addition to the subject and the predicate, a statement of quality must have a linking verb or a copula. That's just a fancy word for linking verb. And that means has or have the quality of being, or has or have the nature of being. Therefore, or thus, P has the quality of being a Q. A chair has the quality of being an impermanent phenomena. A statement such as P has the quality of being a Q is a bit formal, not very likely in ordinary speech. Uh, so uh, that's kind of like a summary of what we've just been through, I think. I don't see anything new there that's that he's trying to bring out. It's just like a summary. In the end, I think that this sort of statement should apply only to existence. Okay, so this is something new. A chair has the quality of being an impermanent phenomena, but the horns of a rabbit does not have the quality of being a non-existent. Why? Because the horns of a rabbit does not have any qualities. Because <laughs> it doesn't exist. So, Although we can use non-existence in different ways in syllogisms, um, we're not going to be applying qualities to them. So he's going to explain that a little bit more. Okay, so uh, the horns of rabbit does not have any qualities. So it is suitable to say that the linking verb may also mean may be said to be. Okay, so that's a way of getting around. Instead of saying it is, you say it may be said to be. So the horns of a rabbit may be said to be a non-existent. It doesn't actually have the quality of being non-existent, but we can still say it's a non-existent. So even though the horns of a rabbit does not have any qualities, it is suitable to say the horns of a rabbit may be said to be non-existent. It is suitable to say anything about the horns of a rabbit, though it is, it is a non-existent. Uh, this backs off a little from the earlier explanation of the linking verb required by statements of qualities. But don't throw out the P has the quality of being a Q because it works. That's the predominant way that things are explained. That's what he's saying there. To gloss the linking verb as may be said to be is very weak. Defensible, but weak. So there may come a time where you're debating something and you need to talk about horns of a rabbit. And, and you can assert they are said to be non-existent. The subject is always a concrete or abstract singular, so it is best to use 
the indefinite article a or an in both parts of the sentence when possible. This is just better English, so this is the point I was trying to convey. It may take some mental force to hear a chair is a material phenomena, and keep in mind that the subject is understood as an abstract singular, but it is always better to use normal language when possible. But that is not always possible, as we've just seen. Remember that above I gave the definition of an example of something that is not an exemplifier of itself. This is because definition in and of itself, the collective entity, is not a definition, right? But a defini definiendum, something that is defined. So it is probably correct to say a definition is a definition. So he's pointing out here that if we're talking about a definition, one definition, we're talking about a particular definition, it seems. And that's different than saying definition is a definition. So again, see, we're training our ear to really listen to understand what is the subject that we're talking about. When we say definition is a definition, um, we're probably talking about the generality of definition. You know, definition as a generality that includes all the definitions that we could think of. And actually, it's not a correct statement, because definition is not a definition. <laughs> right. But a definition is a definition. Yeah, and what if we said, in a similar way, what if we said definitions are definitions? Uh, in my mind, it works, because now you're talking about a pervasion, and you're not talking about, well, okay, it depends. It depends if you're talking about the generality, or you're talking about the instances of the generality. Yeah. Yeah. And then the more we learn about collective topics, which includes generalities and instances, then this hopefully this will become clear. I guess about this, I was trying to understand what the subject was, and he said you can't say it's it's a collection. You can't. He wouldn't allow me to use that word. A collection. Yeah. The subject isn't a collection. It ha because a collection, he just wouldn't allow it. And I think it's because it's a collection uh, or collection. You know, it's like, that's what I was trying to say that. And he was saying that, no, it's not. And I'm thinking from what I'm hearing here is that because you always have to say a collective whole because it keeps it singular. Mm. And somehow, yeah, it just it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know. He didn't say why. Uh -huh. So it's hard, I, you know, I still have some problems with this, but yeah, it well, helpful, it's helpful for me to go back to just the basic thing, it's always singular, and to remember it as a singular whole, or a collective entity, you know, just, I, I'm trying to stick to his words, and yeah. that's helping. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so let's continue there uh, underneath a definition is a definition. That is sort of irresistible because whatever qualifies as a definition must be a definition. <laughs> However, definition itself is not a definition because it is something that is defined. Thus, to point out that a definition is a definition does not say anything about the collective whole definition in and of itself. Because definition itself is not a, de a definition. So sometimes the indefinite article before the subject has to be dropped in order to express the meaning correctly. So if we're talking about a collection or a generality, we would probably drop the article. Like if we're talking about objects of knowledge, we wouldn't say, we would just say object of knowledge, which includes every existent thing. We wouldn't say, if we say an object of knowledge, then we're only talking about one thing. So how does this work? Down at the bottom of 79. How does this work? The two players here are definition and definiendum, literally meaning the thing defined. That's what definiendum means, the thing defined. 
Generally, we think of a definition as a string of words that describe something identifying the essential characteristic of that thing. Many people are not familiar with the word definiendum, but you can tell from the structure of the word as derived from Latin that it refers to that which is defined. So we tend to think of both, both of them as words. However, in the Buddha system, the definition is the actual object, and the definiendum is the name designated to that object. So that's different, isn't it? Like, for instance, the definition of a vase or a pot is a flat bottom, bulbous bellied phenomena that can hold function and functions to hold water. So if we were to say that, we're talking about the actual thing. Though that, that definition is talking about the actual object. And vase or pot is just the name that's applied to that actual object. It's imputed on that object. Is the definition talking about it? It is. The it's actual. not talking about it. it. It is. So that string of words that you just said is the actual object. It yes. So if I had a vase here, we would say this is a flat bottom, bulbous bellied phenomena that functions to hold water. That's the Buddhist definition of a vase. And we're talking about the actual object right there. Not the not the description. Not the string of words. We have to use words to describe it. How else are we going to, if we're talking about it? If we just look at it, we don't need the words. We can see, look, it's flat, bottom, it's kind of bulbous, bulbous belly. <laughs> a lip, sometimes it talks about a lip hanging over. So that's the definition, no string of words. No, that's the definition. The definiendum is what is defined, and so the word base is what's defined. Those words work for that at all. It just really throws me off. I have to just think of it as definium is the name. There, okay. It's good. so simple that way good. to me. Thank you. And Let's simplify. The definition is the object, even though that's not the way we, it's not how we use the word in English. In English, we use the word as you look it up and it's this string of words that's describing something. But that's not how it's used in this. It's the thing itself. And I, when he talks, when he says these things this way, I'm like, that which is defined. To me, that which is defined is the thing itself. So I get it just, I get these words, I, <clears throat> when they do this, I read this, I'm like, I get mixed up every time. So I just have to go back. Definium is the name of it. And what is it? It's, you know, I, I like to think of it as how we actually learn this. We don't start with the name. We actually think of how you, like when you see something you've never seen before and you're like, what is that thing? It's, you know, it's this, this, you know, it's the object and you don't... You don't have the name that you're going starts. to apply to it yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't, it doesn't go the other way around. Um, how we learn Actually, things. it can go the other way around. You can have a sound generality or a meaning generality. Right. Like someone can tell you about the ocean, but if you've never seen the ocean, right, but you just you, have a... Right, you just have a sound generality, yeah. but you don't know the meaning generality. And so you can't put the two together. Yeah. I wonder how that works in the system if you only have a sound generality. And you say they say it's easier to know the definition than the definiendum. But if you only have the, the definiendum, how does that work? I'm <laughs> not sure. Think about that is they're not they're kind of talking about different things a little bit. The sound generality isn't yet a definiendum because you haven't connected it to anything. That's a good point. Yeah, I think you're right. You don't really know what that object yeah, is yet. Yeah, you just know this sound. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Like black hole black, or, yeah, or black like matter. Some sound, you know, some sound. Like you hear a word in another language and you keep hearing that word, but you have no idea what it is. You know, like, I don't know, pick a word. Hmm? Toad. Toad? <laughs> yeah, some word in another language that you've heard before, <laughs> but you have no idea what it means. So uh -huh. you have the sound generality. What does that mean in German? Translation for sound. Translation oh, for sound. <laughs> very good. <Yeah. laughs> okay, good. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about emptiness? <laughs> we have a sound generally for emptiness. <laughs> Not much of a definition appearing yet. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay. All right, so I appreciate the, the way that you've simplified it there so that it's a little easier to hang on to. Yeah. I wonder if that's uh, a sutra school presentation or if it's just a convention of Buddhist debate. I wonder where it came from, and I don't know. Um, a lot of these things that we're learning, you know, when it's like when you're going to play a sport game. You just decide on rules. It's not like they're inherently the rules of, say, baseball or basketball. They're just the rules that everyone agrees on. And these are the rules that... Um, Buddhist debaters in the Tibetan tradition have agreed on, at least from the Galupa school point of view. They might be slightly different in some of the other the Tibetan sects. That's true for a lot of this. But I think the one about the sound generality and the meaning generality, I think those are things that, that are like, how do I say this? Those are actually the appearing objects of thought. And so yeah. when we try to understand how thought works, it's mostly taught in the sutra school following reasoning, following, following reason. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's kind of like, to me, it seems like it's a description of how it works. Whereas some of these things are just like, they, just, they made their rule, you know, like the one about, the one that really is arbitrary, I think, is the one about calling something like, um, object of knowledge, a permanent. We're that, coming to that. Yeah, that's like completely just like <laughs> yeah. manufactured. It's just a convention. Yeah, they and had to do it, it and works. it makes it work. But what yeah. I find hard with that is that it's like they build all this stuff on that, but you're building it on something that's you've just kind of made up. I find that a little difficult sometimes mm -hmm. when the, the way it plays out. Mm -hmm. Like you forget that you kind of came up with this arbitrary rule, uh -huh. and then you think, well, this can't work. It's like this can't work in real life because, because we made up this arbitrary rule, but I don't know. Sometimes it kind of falls apart for me. Mm -hmm. All right, let's plow ahead here. All right, so in the middle of that uh, paragraph on the top of page 80, he says, however, in the Buddhist system, the definition is the actual object and the definiendum is the name designated to that object. The definition is not just a word or string of words, not a mere description, but the object itself. For instance, the definition of a phenomena, another name for an existent, is that which holds its own entity. Thus, what this means is that the Buddhists are identifying this as the essential characteristic of a phenomena. This does not mean that it is a string of words describing the character of a phenomena but that all of these things that have the character of holding their own entities are suitable to be called phenomena. Does that make sense? Is it turning to gobbledygook? <laughs> the closer we get to 8.15 or 8.30. Okay. The definition is the actual thing, and for the sake of convenience, we designate that which holds its own entity with the, same, uh, with the name phenomena. Thus, the way we understand a term is by first becoming familiar with the actual objects that illustrate its definition. Only then may we understand the definiendum, the mere conventionality, the handy name that we use to designate those sorts of objects, things that hold their own entities and so forth. And this is an important point because when we start working with syllogisms, the reasons that we give, um, you, if you are stuck for a reason to give, you can always give a definition. Because the definition will always be easier to understand than the definiendum. That will make more sense once Venerable teaches about how you develop a syllogism. But like if we said, um, take sound, it's impermanent because it's momentary, or it's changing moment to moment. That would work. We may not understand the definiendum yet, impermanence, subtle impermanence, but we can understand changing moment to moment on a coarse level. Maybe not on the subtle level yet, but... 
comment about how much I agree with what you're saying there because the thing you're bringing up about impermanent and product, mm -hmm. I thought like, what's the deal here? But when mm -hmm. I looked at the definitions of them, product one way it's said is like a created thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a much easier time grokking what a created thing is because I've created things than I do like momentary. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like I've created things, you know, built things or whatever. Yeah. And that's just easier. So I can see. But until I got the definition, I was like, I couldn't understand what's, why is one more readily knowable than the other? Because yeah. I didn't really know what they were talking about with the words until I read the mm -hmm. definitions. Okay. Um. Next, understand that a definition is not in turn defined. That is, there is no definition of any particular definition. So if we were, um, yeah, I'm getting ahead of the game here. <laughs> if we were to say, take sound, it's impermanent because it's momentary. If that didn't work for somebody that we were giving it to as a syllogism, we might try to say, we would say take sound or sound, the, the subject sound. It is momentary because you know you're trying to trying to keep going to give them some kind of information that's going to land with them. We're trying to bring them along to our way of seeing things. But you, there is no definition for momentary it, because it is a definition. That's what he's saying here. We'd have to use something else. It's momentary because it's changing from moment to moment or. Um, Anyway, that, that will make more sense in the future, I promise. I, su I suppose you could. I mean, she's making the point that if impermanent is more subtle than product, then the definition of impermanent would be more subtle than product. So you probably could. But at that point, you're probably trying to give them something. I think you would use descriptive, but not a definition, like because it's changing from moment to moment. It's, it's constantly changing. It's, it's not static. Um, you know, you just try to use more descriptive. Things. Looking at the what you just read a little bit ago about the way we understand a term is by first becoming familiar with the actual objects uh -huh. that illustrate the definition. Mm -hmm. And then from that we understand the definienda, which seems to be the larger category, the larger category. So if I am understanding correctly, in this system of reasoning, we go from the singular up to the broad is is that correct and is it inductive some kind of an inductive reasoning or i don't think so the singular up to the broad i think it's like a child learns you know a child can use a cup before they ever know how to say the word cup or before some right. they, they connect the label with the thing right. they they understand it, so, yeah the function of it so you go from they may one not understand specific, the definition well. So you go from one specific instance, and from that specific instance, you understand the category of oh, all see. instances. Like that if you are understand that. one cup, you're going to understand, understand all cups. All. Yeah, so. that's a little different, I think. That's a little different okay. than understanding the definition, which is the thing, and then understanding the label you apply to it. Okay, got it. The definiendum. Next, understand that a definition is not okay. We, we read that definition may be described or explained but they are not defined by their own definition. Though any particular definition is never defined in turn, this is not true of definition in and of itself, for definition in and of itself is not a definition, but a definition. This is just a play on words. <laughs> this is really what it's getting down to. And there's a lot of that in this system, you'll find, especially in the Tibetan. This is so because there is a definition of definition. For definition is defined as that which is triply qualified, substantial, existent. We'll get to a description of that on page 305. Don't worry about that for now. Um, a definition is called a substantial existent because it is the actual object, the meaning or referent of its definition. That's, is, is this, this may be, yeah, some of the difficulty that we were talking about before. But definition itself is not a definition, but a definiendum. In order to mark that clearly, the subject is stated without an article. Definition. That's the main point he's making here. It's stated without an article. 
So it's talking about the category. I gave her her medicine already, but you can give her more. Okay. The cat. Like we were talking about the cat. <laughs> no. Okay. So, again, in order to mark that clearly, the subject is stated without an article. Definition is a definiendum. Uh, and definition is not a definition. Those are both correct statements, aren't they? Can you see that? Does that make sense? Okay. This is a bit dense, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, thus, something, oh, thus, sometimes the indefinite article, a or an an, must be left out of the subject in order to alert the reader to the fact that the subject can be understood as the abstract singular, the thing in and of itself, even though uh, including the indefinite article would be more grammatically English or more gr grammatically correct. This does not mean we need to speak to Binglish. <laughs> Now, uh, English spoken in the mold of Tibetan, which does not typically use indefinite articles. Rather, we should always try to use ordinary English when possible and bear in mind how statements of qualities are understood in this system. So we're trying to balance both things. Okay, what's more, the way the statements are understood is not that unusual. Now, here's a new thing. We can talk about negative qualities as well or the negation of a quality. He says, of course, though everything that exists is a common locus of multiple qualities, nothing is a common locus of all qualities. Thus, some statements of qualities are negative. P is not a Q. Professor Purdue is not British. P does not have the quality of being a Q. Professor Purdue does not have the quality of being British. Definition is not, does not have the quality of being a definition. That's a correct statement. Definition, the generality, does not have the quality of being definition, a definition. For these is not or are not statements, it is suitable to consider the meaning of the linking verb to be, does not have the quality of being, or does not have the nature of being. Even for non-existence, which do not have any qualities at all, a statement denying it has such and such quality works. Okay, so here's the exception, right? We, we said before that we wouldn't use um, non-existence in qu statements of quality because they don't have qualities. Hello. Even for non-existence, which do not have any qualities at all, a statement denying it has such and such qualities works. Thus, the horns of the rabbit does not have the quality of being an existent. Okay, so that's just an exception to the rule. So then here's a summary. In sum, in the collected topics tradition the Buddha, of Buddhist debate, for a statement of qualities, the subject is either a concrete singular when the statement is about something clear and concrete like the White House or my favorite chair, or is an abstract singular, and the predication is always collective, never distributive. The qualities of a phenomena as a singular entity may be distinct from the qualities of the illustrations of that phenomena in, a w in the way that definition itself is a definiendum, but no definition is a definiendum. No definition. But no definition is a definiendum. Okay. No instance of a definition is a definiendum. Yep. Because it's a definition. <laughs> It is easier to understand the collective whole, the thing in and of itself, when the subject is a concrete singular thing, like a chair in the room. But trying to understand the nature of an abstract singular subject is important too. Okay, that's, and then there's this statement, that the issue of the nature of the subject goes to questions of generalities or universals, the basis of designation of phenomena in a, in a consideration of the selflessness of phenomena in Buddhism, and so on. All right, we'll, we'll find that out when we start using syllogisms. Okay, he says, however, we cannot sort everything out up front. He sure tried. <laughs> we sure sorted a lot of things. Rather, it's best to figure out um, a rational procedure and then use it to settle questions. Okay, and as Venerable Tarpa explained last time, for our philosopher friends, let your epistemology inform your ontology, not the other way around. 
So in other words, let your theory of knowledge inform your divisions or explanation of what exists rather than the opposite. All right, now here's these two things. We'll finish with this. These two conventions, they're merely conventions in this uh, system. If anything, is the sub if anything in the subject is existent, then the whole subject is existent. Can you think of an example of that from what we've discussed? Okay, if we were talking about the set, the horn of the rabbit, a horn of a rabbit, the horn of a rabbit and the, the pillar, the pillar, <laughs> I'll use the pillar, <laughs> the two, um, that subject is existent because part of the subject is existent. Yeah. yeah. Or when we talk about the, the generality of selfless, that's the largest category. It includes existence and non-existence, so the whole category is existent. That's basically what that first thing says. We don't need to read all those words. The second one says, if anything in the subject is permanent, then the subject is permanent. Again, another convention like we were discussing earlier. Um, object of knowledge include permanent phenomena and functioning things. So the whole category is permanent, although all the instances within that category are not necessarily permanent. And if, if the whole generality, this is just an aside, if the whole generality, ha if, if all the instances of a generality are impermanent, then the generality itself is impermanent. Like the generality functioning things would include everything that is impermanent, right? Um, pillars, pots, people, shoes, everything. Um, so that whole category is considered impermanent. It's not like every generality, every specific generality is permanent. Okay, so we've finished uh, the description of statements of qualities. I hope you feel so sharp that you could go out and talk at length about statements of qualities <laughs> and continue thinking about... Um, Predicate, nominative, pre predicate, adjective, singular, concrete singulars, abstract singulars, collective predication, distributive predication. Okay, and we'll see how this applies when we actually get into putting together syllogisms. All right, so let any last comments or questions? Yes. Can you think of another, have you thought of another example of like a definition is not a oh, no, definition is not a definition. Is there another example that you can think of that's like that? Um, empty set is not an empty set. That was one that we came up with before. I'm sure there are many other clever statements, and we'll you think about it. Let's see if you can come up with some. Yes. Excellent. Color is not a color. Color the category right yeah. is not a color. I wonder, um, I didn't have time to prepare a lot when I got into that topic of let your epistemology inform your ontology. So I had time to think about that more and I wonder what people think. I decided that the topic was so big that it was like you're in the woods and you can't see the forest. <laughs> but I realized later, in a way, like everything we learned about low rig is like the theory of knowledge in a way. And even the way they decide like what is, um, we, we say like in the Satantrika following reasoning, we say what's a specifically characterized phenomena, what's a generally characterized phenomena, and we decide that based on how it is known. Mm. We do that, it's completely defined by how it's known. Do you see it with a direct perception or do you see it with conception you know? mm -hmm. and so in a way it's I was thinking like wow and it, then I was thinking about like a lot of like we have ways that we do our analysis when we do Lam Rim meditations I mean just a lot of the ways that we do things has a lot to do with how we're knowing things I mean it's almost like most a lot of what we're doing I was thinking and then that's going to lead us to what really exists Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of thought, like, I didn't understand this terminology very well and some of the questions that had come up, but then I had time to think about this, and I was reading stuff, and I was like, wow, everything we've been studying for years is kind of like 
somewhat agrees with that. In the end, I think they kind of meet, you know. But it seems like that's partly what we've been doing. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if people could think about that and see what you think. It kind of surprised me. Uh huh. <laughs> Because I couldn't, I couldn't understand these words very well for uh-huh. the longest so, time. And when Tanya and Jay would say stuff, I like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm listening as carefully as I can. I'm like, my brain is like, Bleh. and then I had time to read stuff, and it came up in some different things, and it, I understand more what they're referring to with these words. And then I was like, wow, this is kind of like what we've been doing. Mm-hmm. I don't know though. Maybe you can think about it while you're analyzing the nature of your <laughs> afflictions. 